you guys like your doors at night? I know I do. I live in a pretty nice neighborhood. But I still lock my doors at night. Why, you may ask? Well, because of the slight chance that somebody could break in and do us harm. Now, could they break in even if I lock my doors? Yeah, they could. But you know what they say. Just got to make it hard for a thief to get in. A thief is always looking for the easy way in. I remember my days at Ohio State <clears throat> back in the 90s. Um, we lived right off campus in Columbus, Ohio, and when you lived in these apartment buildings that were right off campus, there were so many students. I mean, there was like 60,000 undergrads. I mean, it was its own city, basically. And uh, I know you're looking at my neighborhood right now, and like you see like a car like a truck right here, and then down the street you have another truck. Well, when you live in a city like Columbus, Ohio, with all those students, it's like car, 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 like bumper to bumper. Thousands of cars parked on the street. Thousands. Bumper to bumper, right next to each other, right down the street. The only thing you weren't allowed to do was park in front of a fire hydrant. You weren't allowed to block a driveway and you weren't allowed to park within a certain number of feet of a stop sign. Basically, there was like no parking signs everywhere. So if you parked in front of a no parking sign or in between this area that said no parking from here to here, then you would get a parking ticket to which you'd probably just crumple it up and throw it away. But anyway, um, what I'm trying to explain is all these cars that would be parked along the street I remember one morning I got up and uh, I was going down to jump in my car to work and I was walking and the thing is is like you're really really lucky if you can park right in front of your apartment building sometimes you have to park like three streets away because there's literally no spots anywhere I mean if you had a garage like that was like prime parking but we didn't have garages or parking lots that we could park in so anyway, I get up in the morning, I, I gotta go to work, and I'm parked like three blocks away. I'm walking down the street and I turn the corner and I see this dude. He's walking up to every single car and he's just lightly pulling on the door handle to see if it's locked or not. If it's locked, he moves on to the next one. And then I kind of started like, shuffling my feet like that to get his attention because I wasn't going to be like hey you what are you doing I just kind of like made my presence known and then he kind of looked up really quick and then he just stopped doing what he was doing and walked down the street and went around the corner and as soon as I was gone I'm sure he started doing it again but uh after that I was like I mean I I would always make sure to lock my doors, but after that, I was doubly sure to lock my door. Like I would double check, triple check, make sure that all my doors were locked, you know, door to the car, door to the apartment, whatever. So, I mean, if that guy really wanted to break into a car, he could just take a hammer or a wrench or a baseball bat or whatever and break in. But that, that's really noisy, right? He doesn't want to go through all that. He just wants to walk up to a car and just, and if it's open, he goes in, right? And those of us who locked our doors, we were, um, for that thief at least, we were fortunate enough to where that was enough of a deterrent for him to move on to the next one. But who ended up getting broken into? The idiot who didn't lock his, his uh, car. That's who ended up getting broken into. So you know what they say, if you're, if you're being chased by a lion and there's a group of you, 
You don't have to be faster than the lion. You just have to be faster than the slowest guy. Right? The slowest guy is the one who gets caught. So all you got to do is lock your doors. For the most part. Now, if somebody really wants to get in your house because they know that there's something in your house that they really want, then I'm sure they can find a way to break in your house. But that's why we need to lock our doors to everything. Cars, houses, sheds, whatever. Lock it up. Lock it. It's funny, um... On that same note, we, uh, we as parents, we really love our kids. We want to protect our kids. Last thing we want is somebody to abduct our children, hurt our children, anything like that. It's another reason why we lock our doors, right? Because it's like your biggest nightmare. I mean... You know, when I was younger, people would ask me, what's your biggest fear? And I would, it would always be something happening to me. Well, my biggest fear is drowning. or My biggest fear is being buried alive. You know, you think of all these horrible ways that you could die. When you get older and you have kids, it totally changes. Your biggest fear is no longer anything that would ever happen to you. It's only things that would happen to your children. That's your biggest fear ever. It's your biggest fear. Somebody doing something to my child. It's my biggest fear. So we lock our doors, right? It's a good it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. You should lock your doors. But what I'm wondering is why we go through all the trouble of locking our doors. But we don't take the extra step of preventing people from coming into our house a different way. And that way being the television, the devices, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, letting your children be friends with any Tom, Dick, and Harry out there who could influence them, fill their minds with garbage, tell them that there's something that they're not, um, introduce them to pornography at a very young age where they literally can't even handle what they're looking at. They can't process it. They can't take it in. It's too overwhelming. or have them listening to some guy or gal on the internet convince them something about themselves that isn't necessarily true or something about the world that isn't necessarily true. You know, your kid's getting exposed to all kinds of things that you have no idea they're getting exposed to. Why? Because you're not, you're not monitoring your kids enough. You're not, you're not monitoring what they're doing, you know? Back when I was a kid, the internet wasn't even a wet dream. The internet wasn't even a, nobody could even fathom what the internet was. When I was a kid, yeah. cable TV was the big thing. That was a big thing. And we were, we were, uh, just me and my brothers and my mom and the three or four TV stations that we had in our house. We had no idea what we were missing. You know, TV wasn't that big of a deal. You know, we used to like to watch um, The Love Boat, followed up by Fantasy Island on whatever it was, Saturday night, Sunday night, something like that. We watched the occasional, you know, This Week in Baseball or Watch the occasional football game or baseball game that came on. And then, of course, Saturday morning cartoons were the big thing. Saturday morning, dude. It's like Saturday morning. 
that is my time to be in front of the TV. Cartoons are on from the time you wake up in the morning until maybe 10 o'clock, 10.30, something like that. And then after that, it's like, okay, now it's just a bunch of boring shit on TV that I don't wanna watch, soap operas or The Price is Right or whatever the hell it was. The news or whatever. It's like, you're a kid, you don't give a shit about any of that stuff. There's nothing on TV that interests you. So what do you do? You're like, okay. TV time for me is over now. I'm gonna go play with my toys or I'm gonna go outside and play outside because there was nothing on TV for me. So, you know, go, go do what I was gonna do. And then, and then my mother got remarried. So my parents were divorced before I even started forming long-term memories. My parents were divorced before I was two years old. I was about one and a half my parents divorced so my memories just started with my brothers and me and my mom living in a single mother household and that was our that was our normal life and we lived, lived in Wisconsin and uh, you know in a small community in Wisconsin and you know there was a lot there was a lot to do outside there was like lakes and you know, trails and stuff like that. And we just, we go fishing or we just walk around or we ride our bikes, or we go outside and play football or baseball, or whatever we do. And if it was too cold to go outside or whatever, or you didn't feel like going outside, you'd play with your toys at home. You read a book or color, whatever. Then when my mom got remarried, I was a little bit older than, uh, we moved to Chicago. I was about I don't know, eight or nine, um, and my stepdad had cable TV. So not only did he have all the, you know, sports channels and this channels and that channels, but he also had the, the movie channels. And I was like, to me, it was like, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was like I felt like I hit the jackpot. It was so so amazing like we could watch movies see to us like seeing a movie was like a big treat it was a big treat to go to the movies and every once in a while my mom would take us to the movies before she got remarried she would take us to the movies and you know she'd be like well this is a pg movie and i heard they have some swear words in it but you know it's no big deal you know they can handle a swear you know we don't go to the movies that often you know, so we go there and they'd say shit or goddamn it or whatever. And me and my brothers would like look at each other, <laughs> kind of giggle. And, uh, you know, you felt all cool. You felt all grown up because you got to see a movie that wasn't G-rated, you know, it was PG or whatever. So that was like a big, that was a big deal for us. But then when my mom got remarried and we moved into my stepdad's house, in Chicago, and, uh, they had the movie channels. Then it was like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You just looked in your little TV guide thing like, ooh, you know, Superman's coming on at, you know, 2 p.m. next Saturday or, you know, whatever. This violent movie, like The Warriors was a big movie that, that we loved to watch. And that was just full of violence and swearing and sexual innuendos and all this stuff. And, uh, my mom didn't really, she didn't monitor us, you know? Me and my stepbrother, we used to stay up as late as we possibly could. Now, I was like maybe 10 years old. We'd stay up like, like we'd be like, okay, we're gonna stay up all night and see if we can stay up all night. And sometimes we did. We literally stayed up until the sun came up. And what kind of movies would come on Cinemax at 3 o'clock in the morning back in the 80s? If you guys are old enough to know what I'm talking about, you know there was nothing good. Uh, it was all basically soft porn is what it was. It was soft pornography. It was, everything was tits and ass, tits and ass, tits and ass. Simulated sex. Everything. 
you know, it wasn't hardcore pornography where they, they're actually having sex, but it was softcore where both people in the film are naked or the guy's wearing like a cock sock and the girl's wearing, you know, very, very skimpy, um, you know, uh, panties that almost, basically they're trying to make it look like she's totally naked. And they got the covers over them in the bed and they're simulating sex. They're not really having sex, but you know, they're groaning and making all the noises and her, her tits are bouncing up and down and just, you know, all that stuff, right? I mean, it's as far as you were concerned as a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old kid, as far as you were concerned, you were watching two people have sex. I wasn't even, I didn't even hit puberty at that point yet. You know, to me, this is just like, you know, I just felt like it was like the holy grail. I mean, I was just like, I loved it. You know, before I even knew why I loved it, I just, I just loved it, you know. And my parents locked the doors every night, you know. But they didn't really realize that people could still get into our house and influence me through the television set, you know, through those movies. And then one night, me and my stepbrother stayed up late, and I'm about maybe 10, 11, and we decided to watch this movie called A Clockwork Orange. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie. Um, that movie had scenes of rape. That movie had scenes of extreme violence. Like killing people with your bare hands kind of violence. Um, uh... It was an intense movie. It was English made and uh, just an extremely intense movie that most adults couldn't even handle. As far as like adults would watch that movie and be like, oh my God, turn this off. This is just, this, this movie is ridiculous. And here I am, 10 year old kid, sitting there eating a bowl of ice cream with my brother stepbrother, really, watching this movie at 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever. <clears throat> I mean, there's literal rape scenes in the movie. I mean, of course, it's soft. It's not actually happening, but it's, you know, the woman screaming and people are holding her down and while well, other people are raping her. I mean, it was, it's just, I mean... To be a young, impressionable boy and watch something like that. Um, it affects you. It affects you. It puts thoughts into your head, it puts images into your head that um, you can't unsee. You can't unsee those things. You know, I felt like my world was completely opening up. Not only that, but, you know, like, I had, my, my stepbrothers were much older than me. So, you know, we would be just talking, goofing around, joking around, whatever. And my stepbrothers, they're just, they just had completely filthy mouths saying all kinds of stuff. I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. You know, I mean, I think I was nine when my... Mom got remarried, and, uh, you know, my my oldest brother was graduating high school, getting ready to go to college, my oldest stepbrother. That's, you know, they were like 10, 11 years older than me. Um, and, uh, you know, you just hear them say all kinds of stuff. I mean, you guys can imagine talking about, you know, fucking and jerking off and orgasm and you know blah 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 what like 
they they would just you know they would try to be as provocative as possible and they would laugh at me when i'd be like what's an orgasm what what is that they'd be like <laughs> oh, he's so stupid he doesn't even know what that is you know and that gets you like oh well i need to i need to find out what that is so i'm not stupid anymore i'm not cool i gotta find out what that is so i can be cool and then what i didn't understand is that no kids my age really knew what the hell that was or i would say 90 plus percent of the kids my age didn't know what that was so then i would go to school and i would say those words you know and my friends would be like what what the hell and then you know they'd tell the teacher you know Shafe just said that, like, I don't even know what that is. I'm pretty sure it's a bad word, but... And then the teacher would come over and be like, um, you can't say that. I, I quickly realized that I was, like, one of those kids in school that had the filthy mouth that the other parents would tell their kids, you're not allowed to play with Shafe, you know? And what did I know? I didn't know. Oh, I thought, I thought my phone was dying again. I didn't know that, the, you know, I didn't know that that was a, what I was saying was bad or wrong. I just, I just thought I was cool. I thought I was being cool, you know? <laughs> oh, geez. And nowadays, I'm raising my kids, and there's these kids in our neighborhood, you know, or there's like always one kid in the class that comes to, comes to school talking about, you know, talking about sex or talking about drugs or talking about whatever. It's ridiculous stuff. Completely ridiculous stuff. You know, like one one kid on my son's baseball team was talking about dildos, right? My son's 11. You know, he comes home from baseball practice. He's like, Daddy? I was like, yeah. What's a dildo? And <laughs> like spit my drink out. Where the hell did you hear that? Oh, uh, this kid on my baseball. Yeah, I know that. I know exactly who said it. I know. It's that same asshole that says all that other shit. So what is it, Daddy? I'm like, don't worry about what it is. Well, I really want to know what it is now. I'm like, great. So now I got to talk to him about what a dildo is. I got to tell him what a fucking dildo is. And it's like, you know, people are going to be like, well, Shafe, you know, you got to have those conversations with your kids eventually. And it's like, yeah, I do. But it's like, I don't think I should be having to talk to an 11-year-old about what a fucking sex toy is. Since he hasn't even hit puberty yet. You know, it's just one of those things where, like, kids are growing up too fast in this world. And you as a parent, you're either going to get ahead of it. Or are you going to be behind it? And you want to get ahead of it. Period. Because if you're behind it, that's no bueno. That means that other kids are teaching your kids about sex. And they're saying a bunch of ridiculous stuff. You know? Daddy, what's a clitoris? Daddy, what does it mean to ejaculate? My friend was talking about ejaculate. Like... <sighs> Well, son, you're 11, and I guarantee you at that at your point, that at the point in your life, you have not ejaculated yet. But I guess we have to talk about this, even though you haven't even had sex education yet. Now, he's going into sixth grade. He's getting ready to get all that stuff. But, you know, the idiots, really the idiots are the parents of these children. But they're, you know, they're getting to your kids. They're saying stuff to your kids. And it's very important to keep an open dialogue with your kids. You can't punish them, you know. If your son comes home from baseball practice and he's talking about dildos, you can't be like, don't you ever say that again. You know, because then he's gonna still hear that shit, but he's, he's, not, but he's gonna be afraid to talk to you about it. You can't punish him. For saying that you just have to be like okay where'd you hear that word okay that's who i thought you heard it from and let's talk about what it is and try to try to define it for your kids you know uh 
try to tell them, okay, this is what it is. And you don't really need to worry about what it is. When you're older, you have a much better idea of what I'm talking about. I'm trying to explain to this kid what a dildo is. And he's like, his mind is blown. He's like, why would somebody even want one of these things? I'm like, oh, well, that's a whole different story. Why somebody would want it. Um, you know, and it's like, what do I tell my kid? What do I not tell my kid? His interest is already spiked. So if I tell him nothing, then he's going to go Google it. Or he's going to go back to that same friend and ask him to explain it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is you got to do more than lock your doors. To keep your kids safe. You got to monitor everything they do. Everything. Everything they look at, everyone they talk to, everything they take in. And you got to be on top of it. You got to get in front of it. Or you're going to be chasing behind. And that's nowhere you want to be.